The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, 41 members of the orchestra and cast of the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, give you a program that is in the nature of a birthday party. For this evening's performance of the Cavalcade of America is its fifth second, ending a full year on the air. This evening's program brings you two dramatic stories of the humanitarian side of America's progress. The first episode concerns a hospital of many years ago, a place of startling contrast to the fine institutions of today, completely equipped with every modern aid and staffed by skilled doctors, interns, and nurses. Research chemistry has helped in this progress by providing such products as bases for medicines that help cure illness and allay pain, and safety x-ray film, an important aid to diagnostic work. Thus, medicine is still another field in which the research chemist is helping to make good the pledge described in DuPont's phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. John Voorhees and his orchestra bring us a special arrangement of Sweethearts from Victor Herbert's operetta of the same name. swiftly the cavalcade of America has moved, the marchers in its band have always had time for the neighborly deeds which enrich life. Tonight we bring you two stories of Americans who extended the helping hand to others. The first is laid in New York City at the end of the Civil War. In the home of the Schuylers, young Miss Louisa Lee Schuyler lies severely ill from the exhaustion of her war work. Lying in her bedroom, she talks to her younger sister, Georgina. 
Georgina. What's the matter? Why are you crying? Won't you tell me? Someone has to, I suppose. Has the doctor some bad news about me? I think he's known from the start. But it was only yesterday that he talked to Father about you quite frankly. What did he say? It, it'll be a long time, Louisa, before you're well. How long? Months? Years? Two or three years. Maybe longer. That is a long time. The doctor had to console Father by reminding him you were a heroine. He said your name would go down with Clara Barton for your wonderful work in assembling food and medicine for our men. I... I haven't minded this illness so much until now. Oh, Louisa, don't lose courage. I worked so long to help sick people, but never before have I realized exactly how they felt. The isolation, the loneliness... The hopelessness of marking time for so long. You'll get well, Louisa. Well, if I do, I'll never again be like most people. Take my happiness for granted. Louisa Lee Schuyler broken and exhausted, went abroad in search of help. Seven weary years of exile finally gave her sufficient strength to return. Hardly had she come back to New York before she began planning a new occupation for herself. She would organize visiting committees at poorhouses and hospitals, for those of that day were not at all like those of the present time. In a public hospital in New York, Louisa Lee Schuyler is shown about by a young intern. Oh, you, you seem rather faint, Miss Schuyler. Perhaps you haven't strength enough to finish inspecting the hospital. Oh, yes, I, I can go on. But seeing the dirt and rubbish in the children's war that made me feel so badly. If you'll forgive my saying so, Miss Schuyler. It's very unusual for a woman like you to come to such a place as this public hospital. It must be, judging from the sights I've seen. I'm amazed that the board of this hospital would permit outsiders to visit. Well, I was given no very definite orders. I thought if an intelligent outsider wants to see the wards... Let her see them. You say that as though you were challenging me. Perhaps I am. You see, I'm younger than the other interns and new to the hospital. I've seen things here that I believe outsiders ought to know of. I'd like to show you one more ward. It's the old people's ward, right here. Afternoon, Doctor. Bring a visitor in at this hour. She can't see anybody now. Miss Schuyler has special permission from the board. Oh, beg your pardon, Miss. Well, Robert, you show her around. I'm going to get my dinner. Good day to you. Who takes her place? No one. A night watchman makes rounds of all the wards. But there are 800 patients. Yes. No one gets much attention at night. Miss, Miss, would, would you talk to me, please? Well, yes. It's been so long since I've seen anyone young. Well, I'll gladly talk to you. Uh, do you like custard? I've still got some left in this basket. I've even brought a spoon. Thank you. We're always hungry here. Would you like me to bring you something from the outside? I could bring books or fancy work. Could, could you bring me clean clothes? If you've any old ones about your house. I'll see that you get them tomorrow. I'll bring them. God bless you, Miss. I've seen enough, Doctor. I'm going. You're not going, Skyler, and never coming back. But what can I do? I, I did have a plan for organizing women with leisure and social feeling... To visit patients and cheer them up. But what could we do about filth and this carelessness is nearly as bad as deliberate cruelty? I really don't know, Miss Schuyler, but if there's a way to help, I believe you'll think of it. Dazed by the spectacle of dirt and careless attendance in the public hospital... Louisa Lee Scarlett realized that no mere visiting committee could remedy the situation. Risking her strength by the labor, she organized a group of citizens to make a demand that had never before been heard in this country. In the boardroom of New York's public hospital, a group of officials face Miss Schuyler and her committee. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to take a vote on the question of throwing open the wards of our hospital to nurses from a school founded by Miss Schuyler's committee. I want you to remember that this school is so far only a theory. None of the good ladies who hope to found it are nurses. Mr. Clark, just a moment. Yes, Miss Schuyler. I may not be a nurse, but I know about sickness. I was ill for years, and I know how a sick person cherished small comfort. As for your hospital, I went over it thoroughly. I saw filth, vermin, and great suffering. Well, can't all this be corrected without this, this fuss? Without upsetting things, Miss Schuyler? Doctors have no time to dust on the beds or to roll clean bandages or to see that food is clean. That's the work of nurses. And they should learn it just as a doctor learns his profession. But who's to teach them, Skyler? That's why I hurried here. I have a letter from Florence Nightingale. All of you know her work. She saved thousands of lives for England in the Crimean War and thousands since at St. Thomas Hospital in London. She has a nurse's school, the only one in the world. And she urges us to start one here as soon as possible. Uh, perhaps we could have for our first superintendent some English woman named by Florence Nightingale. Won't you take the vote now, Mr. Clark? Well, I suppose we may have a show of hands. We can call the roll later. Those in favor of opening the hospital wards to students in a school to be started by Miss Schuyler's committee. Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Well, there's no need for a roll call. The motion is carried. As soon as possible, our wards will be staffed by members of the new school for nurses. The idea of training nurses rapidly spread all over the country, and hospital cleanliness and efficiency rose tremendously. But Louisa Lee Schuyler did not stop with her efforts for hospitals. She fought for state care of the insane and succeeded after long effort in getting it. In 1915, when she was in her 70s, she learned of the number of children who become blind through lack of proper care. Determinedly, despite her age, she led a crusade to prevent blindness and to care for those already blind. A few years later, in a doctor's office in New York City, Louisa Lee Schuyler comes to call. Well, now, what's really on your mind, Miss Schuyler? You look the picture of health. <laughs> the last time I saw you, doctor, I told you I was going to work to prevent blindness and help those already blind. Yes, yes. Oh, you said I couldn't. Positively. <laughs> Not a 73. <laughs> well, I, I confess it's a good thing you ignored me. Do you think so? Truly? Well, I don't have to tell you how much I admire what you've done, Miss Skyler. You're very kind. No, 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 not at all. Why, everyone has praised you for your wonderful work. But what appeals to me most is your Society for the Prevention of Blindness. I'm glad. Uh, right here on my desk, I have the latest report of your Committee on the Prevention of Blindness. Have you seen it? Uh, yeah, that, well, I, it just reached me this morning, and I, I didn't have an opportunity to read it. Then please allow me to read you the figures. Yes, Doctor, please do. <clears throat> uh, 702 cases treated during the last three months were pronounced complete cures. Of the remaining 200, we have not given up hope. Some may yet be saved for useful, happy lives. Oh, the figures are getting better all the time. Yes, they are, Miss Skyler. And I congratulate you. Thousands saved from darkness. Bless your name. I'm very glad of that. Because, uh, did you notice how I stumbled coming in? My maid, Anna, brought me down to your office. Because we don't want any family and friends to fuss over me just yet. My own eyes have been failing gradually. Well, Miss Scarlett, I'm sorry to hear that. But you can still see. I could see your figure in the strong light when I came in, but not clearly. I can't see you at all now. Oh, Miss Scarlett, I had no idea that... Oh, at my age, I wonder if it matters. I've accomplished my work. It can go on without me now. <laughs> After giving the last years of her strength to saving the sight of others, 
Louisa Lee Schuyler went blind herself. But even in her blindness, she toiled for her charities until her death in 1926. Led by her example, the trained nurses and the social workers of America have set a high standard of accomplishment. Today, the work of caring for others is the sole concern of countless American men and women. The Cavalcade of America presented by DuPont moves on. A splendid example of the helping hand in modern privately supported welfare organizations is the Traveler's Aid Society, which within the last 20 years has stepped into a field not previously undertaken. Our story starts in a small Midwestern town, the home of the Austin. It is spring, and at the Austin dinner table, 10-year-old Russell Austin is arguing with his father. Won't you please put this on me, Dad? Just for a minute. Oh, but your father is perfectly right about your table manners, Rusty. Take care of it. Yes, but he's been fussing at me all through dinner about dozens of things. That'll be all, young man. Finish your dessert. I think it's spring vacation that makes him so restless, Will. I'll be glad when school starts again. Gee, Mom, that's an awful thing to say. Don't bang your spoon around like that. Bring the coffee in the living room, Ellen. All right. I want to read the paper in peace. Now you've worried your father again, Rusty. He worries me, too. Now, that isn't a nice way to talk, son. Oh, Mother, I don't believe there's any nice way to talk. Why do I have to be an example all the time? But, dear, your father only wants you to be a gentleman. He whiz, none of the other kids have to be as polite as I do. All right, dear. Now, be a good boy while I take your father his coffee. And please, be more careful. Can I go out and play for a while, Mother? Can no. I? No, certainly not, Rusty. You know we don't like you to go out in the evening. Oh, gee, I never have any fun. You will. Everything. I'm tired of living in Conover and tired of having my family fuss at me. I'm like a wolf and forget everything. Wouldn't you, Spider? Well, I haven't got much to forget. I wish I lived in, oh, Australia. I'd like to go there and to China and India. Gee, Spider, I read about a boy who ran away and went to sea. You wouldn't dare. I don't know. Maybe I would. A few days later, in the waiting room of a railroad station in New York, at the desk of the Traveler's Aid Society, Miss Edith Clare and her assistant talked together. Are you sure that's the boy, Edith? I've been watching him for five minutes. He looks like the description, but I'm going to have a word with him. You stay here and watch the desk. Hello, young man. Are you traveling alone? Uh, yes, ma'am. Mind if I sit beside you a minute? You needn't be afraid to talk to me. I'm from the Traveler's Aid Society on 44th Street. What's that? Well, we help put people on trains and tell them anything they need to know about how to get where they're going. Are you on a long journey? Pretty long. I'm going to Australia. Australia? You're going to Australia by yourself? Yes, I... I got an answer. It's going to meet me in, the, uh, in San Francisco. Well, you're going to have an interesting trip. Are your family Americans or Australian? Well, um, my father was a sea captain. He, he had a big sailing ship and went all over the world with it. Oh, how splendid. And your mother, she was an American? No. She was a bareback rider in a circus. For goodness sake. Well, how did they ever happen to me? Oh, I... Yes, my father must have gone to the circus. Yes. Once when he was on shore, he, he did go to the circus, and, and they, they, they got married. But my father and mother aren't alive now. I'm an orphan. I'm so sorry. Well, then maybe I can help you all the more. What train are you taking? Oh, it doesn't go for a while yet. Well, I can tell when you leave if you'll let me see your ticket. Uh, I don't exactly remember where I put it. But you better look before your train comes. Well, maybe I'll take a bus. You don't seem very certain. Rusty, how did you know my name? Why, 
Well, it's written on your handkerchief. Oh. As you're not sure about your train, now why don't you stay in New York tonight? Well, I don't know. As a matter of fact, I might just sit here a while in the station. Well, I know a better place. It's a kind of hotel for boys. Only you don't have to pay a cent. I could take you over there tonight. What for? Why, to sleep, Rusty. On a nice, soft bed with clean, warm sheets. It's time to start a journey in the morning. Well, I might sleep in a hotel tonight for nothing. We'll go over and get a car. Come on, this way. Peter. I was right, Ruth. You take the bed. See you later. All right. Uh, pardon, Miss Daly. Oh, hello, Ryan. Who is that Miss Clare's leading out of the station? Uh, that, Ryan, is the boy that we've been waiting to see show up for a week. Rusty Austin. Oh, the Austin young man, eh? I'll call the sergeant right away. Have his aide taking charge? We'll take charge. It frightens him less. Edith will take care of him. Ah, it's one grand job you do. They're clever young women. Oh, it doesn't take much work to spot a child. Edith has a way, you know, of making them feel at home. That's yeah, the third child you've helped this week. <laughs> the department will be giving you a medal. <laughs> it's spring, Ryan. As some people know it by the robins, but in the traveler's aid, we know it by the runaways. In the same way, hundreds of children every year, some frightened runaways, some traveling alone, are cared for by the society. Lodgings are found for strangers alone in large cities. And young girls, aged people, and inexperienced travelers find that the desks of the traveler's aid in the railroad and bus terminals of cities large and small, friendly advice or active aid when it is needed. The day after Russell Austin's arrival in New York, at the private home where Rusty has been taken care of, Rusty and Edith Clare of Traveler's Aid have a talk. About how soon do you think you'll have to be leaving us, Rusty? Why, as soon as you want me to. We'd like to keep you all the time. But I'm afraid your father and mother wouldn't like that. My father and mother? Well, I know you told me you were an orphan. But that was because you were pretending to be someone else, wasn't it? Hmm? Uh-huh. You wanted to live an entirely different life. So you had to seem like a different boy to yourself. With a sea captain for a father. Yes, and my family lives in Conover. And they're awful strict. That's why I can't ever go home. Oh, Rusty, of course you can. But they're awfully anxious to see you. No, I can't ever face them. See, I know how my dad feels about being disgraced. You haven't done anything disgraceful, Rusty. All of us think we want to get away from home sometimes and see the world. Only next time. Wait till you're older. And then tell your dad about it first. Will you? That's the way to have the most fun, you know. And, Rusty, your mother and father are coming here tonight. They're coming here? Well, they've been looking for you. Now, you're not going to be scared, are you? Sure, I'm scared. I wouldn't mind going back, but it's meeting Dad right at first bothers me. Well, I'll talk to him a while and explain everything. How's that? Would you tell him I... I guess I got kind of sore and started going down the road almost before I... Oh, I'll tell him. But when you thought over about meeting him yourself, just come in the next room, will you? I'll be in there. All right, Miss Claire. I don't, will. Don't worry now, Rusty. If you want me, just call. Mrs. Austin. Oh, Miss Claire. Is he here? Oh, why did he do it? Well, that's something parents usually know better than anyone else, Mrs. Austin. Oh, we've had a terrible winter. There's been business trouble to play. Isn't Mr. Austin been nervous and overworked? Everything was settled last week. But nothing until after my boy ran away. I wouldn't attach too much importance to Rusty leaving home, Mr. Austin. Hundreds of children do it every year and regret it. It's one of the biggest responsibilities that comes to us in the traveler's age. Your organization did a splendid job of finding him. I, I'll never be grateful enough. Oh, when he comes back, I'll never let him out of my sight. Uh, Mrs. Austin, we don't like to give positive advice to people on how to train their children. But from what I've seen of Rusty, I think he's had too much watching. Yes. I know what you mean, Miss Claire. Well, yes, but you can't be too careful with a child, Miss Claire. This proves it. Most boys want adventure in their lives. But Rusty's wild for it. <laughs> he told me, for instance, Mrs. Austin, that you'd been a bareback rider in a circus. What? What? I've never been on a horse in my life. Now, he knew it wasn't true. He simply wished it were. He wants something unusual in his life. Not so much routine. I think I understand. He ought to be there any moment. Miss Claire, I... Dad! Hello, son. Oh, Rusty. We've worried so much about you. Well, I'll tell you, Mother. No, no. Don't tell us anything, son. We're glad you're coming back. Get your things. We will leave for home on the first train we can catch. And, Rusty, how'd you like to go to the ball game with me Saturday? Oh, gee, Dad. 
That'd be swell. A family is reunited without bitterness or blame. Prepared for better mutual understanding in the future. Unobtrusively, swiftly, because its problems are nearly all emergencies, travelers, aid workers, endeavor to straighten out any tangles in human destinies that occur while the unfortunate man, woman, or child is on the road. America is a nation of travelers, and each year the society aids more people who have learned its value, who see in its work a true instance of the helping hand. Speaking of traveling, last week I had the good fortune to visit the Texas Centennial Exposition being held at Dallas. Besides being a magnificent show, this exposition offers a real education in a score of subjects. Architecture, engineering, manufacturing, and science, including the science of chemistry. For DuPont has an exhibit there. DuPont calls this exhibit the wonder world of chemistry. And the visitor can understand why when he sees the marvelous things produced by research chemists that are on display. The exhibit shows how chemists utilize America's natural resources to produce a variety of useful and beautiful products. One section shows how coal tar is converted into gorgeous colors, rare perfumes, and chemicals that make tires last longer. In another, one gets some idea of the ingenious process by which air, water, and coal are employed in making, on the one hand, a product that prevents automobile radiators from freezing, and on the other hand, a product used in making ice. This same exhibit gives an impressive picture of how a chemical organization such as DuPont creates new markets for the products of the mine, the forest, and the field. It's particularly astonishing to learn the number of uses chemistry has found for farm crops and the quantities of things like cotton, vegetable oils, and corn products that DuPont buys from the farmer. We hope you will be able to visit the Lone Star State before the Texas Centennial closes at the end of November. Over a million people have visited the Wonder World of Chemistry exhibit since it opened in June, and DuPont would be pleased to welcome you there. If you are unable to get to Dallas, perhaps you will find opportunity to visit that famous seaside resort, Atlantic City, New Jersey, over one of these fine fall weekends. On the world-renowned boardwalk, DuPont maintains a permanent exhibit. So far this year, more than half a million people have visited this showplace of chemistry to see the hundreds of products which represent the contributions of chemistry to the comfort and convenience of people everywhere. In the years to come, there will be other DuPont exhibits showing the progress of chemical science. If you have a chance to visit one, do so. You will be welcomed cordially, and I'm sure you will leave with a broader understanding of what DuPont means by its phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Next week at this same time, we will present stories of the fearless guardians of our coast in Lighthouse and Lightship, Sentinels of the Deep, when DuPont again presents the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.